So I've got a few interesting Christmassy related rocks. This is actually an emerald, um, but we nickname it the Christmas tree because it's a little bit like a Christmas tree. If you look at it down end on, you see there's six kind of branches coming out on each side. Yeah, so this, those six branches are sort of like the limbs, if you like, of what would normally be a hexagonal prism crystal, but the rest of the crystal's missing. You've only got the little branches that extend out to the, what would be the faces of the hexagonal prism. Uh, and that's a really unusual thing that happens in emerald and a couple of other minerals, and it's called a trapiche. And uh, sometimes you get these trapiches and they're made into gemstones and they look like a little cogwheel. But this is a really unusual example because we get to keep all of it in the rough. It's not prepared into a gem and it's kind of a bit Christmas tree-like, so. So, Mike, when I think of emeralds, I think yeah. of that kind of shiny, almost translucent gemstone that you'll see in like a yeah. necklace and that. Is that the same kind of emerald? Could that be turned into something that looks like that? I mean, it, it is. Um, obviously, you haven't got large amounts of the green, gemmy stuff available to cut a gemstone out, so you wouldn't do that. But some of these trapiche samples, the between the limbs, if you like, you would actually, that would be filled out with a black material. And if you get ones that are uh, really, you know, aren't going to fall apart, you can slice them through and you can what you call kind of cabochon the top, which is to give them a sort of a polished, slightly rounded surface. And then they, they look great because you have this kind of like cartwheel or cogwheel look. And so there are people who use those for jewellery just like you would an a emerald gemstone too. But that's not, the, there is a difference between what that is and what, what would become a gemstone. It's the same material, chemically, it's just the same. Uh, what's, what's different is the way that they've formed. And the really kind of cool thing about trapeches is we don't actually know how they form. There's quite a few people who've got some ideas on it, but the specific way in which, why we get these limbs and why there's a different mineral inside that in this point has been weathered away, uh, we don't know. So it's kind of cool. A little mystery. Uh, this one came from Colombia, which is where many of the trupiches do come from. There are a few other places around the world, but most of them all come from a deposit in Colombia. And is this something that you get out every Christmas and put on display in the museum? or? Yeah, so well, some, of, some of my team do little talks for people and they've used it as an example, just as sort of, yeah, as a Christmas theme thing. But uh, no, it's not on regular display, so it's... Um, it's something, it's fun, it's nice to get it out and show you, it's a bit special. Where do we go next on our Christmas adventure? On our Christmas adventure, so let's go, how about we go to Christmas Mine? So, Christmas Mine, named after the town of Christmas in Arizona. So, it's, uh, there was, there's a big mine there, obviously. Um, it's a copper porphyry deposit, it's, uh, which is an intrusion into a limestone. The porphyry comes into the limestone, and what it does is it cooks it up, because the porphyry contains a bit of copper, the copper gets into the limestone and the copper and the limestone react with that extra heat and pressure and it produces some weird minerals. And so, so weird in fact, that some of them were actually discovered at Christmas mine. They hadn't been discovered anywhere else beforehand. And we have here three examples of type specimens. So these are the, like the very first samples that were found of these materials. One's called Ruizite, another one Apachite and another one uh, Gilalite, or it's probably Hilalite, because I think its pronunciation is like that. And um, yeah, these are really weird. These two are copper silicates. This one's a, a, a magnesium silicate, or maybe it's manganese. And um, these were the first samples, or the samples that were used to understand the chemistry behind these materials. So they're very important scientifically. I know you're quite fond of the of ty types. You think you've got a bit of a soft spot for them? I have. Yes, um, I think types are really important. So. The link between a specimen and a name is preserved within this material. You know, like so, if if we think something's not quite right about the chemical makeup, we have to go back to the original type to study it. And so these are really important samples, and we have to be we have to think really responsibly about how we might study them because they're a limited supply, but they're probably the most important out there. If these come from a mine in America, yes. like where they were discovered. How have they ended up here at the Natural History Museum in London? Yeah, so the, the guy that did all the work on this, same guy called Sid Williams, he did a lot of work with curators all over the globe, actually, but he did quite a lot of analysis of work here, and he came over here on a sabbatical, actually, at one point. And so he and the curators here worked together on actually characterising some of these samples. And because of that connection, and he appreciated that these samples need to be somewhere where they can be studied in the future in case something's not quite right, um, he deposited the samples in the collection, so which is which is great. 
and they can be a little bit more pretty. So this one's a bit more like a, a perhaps what you might think of as a, of a Christmas sample. So I feel, I feel like this is more appropriate Christmas mine material. But What's, um, is that a different mineral, is it? It is a different mineral. It's another one. It's a, the blue is a mineral called kinoite. And there's also uh, some white samples on there called um, genitoite. So you can see lots of weird names, uh, all from that one place Christmas mine. What well, there isn't, it doesn't seem to be a Christmas site, which is a bit of a shame, because it would have been quite good if they, if they named one. But. Mike, this Christmas mine seems like a bit of a playground for people yeah. who like minerals. Is it, is it like a destination? Like, have you been there or do people go there? Or I haven't been there. Um, I don't know if it still is, certainly in the 70s and 80s when these were being characterised and found. It must have been a great place to go. And uh, Ruiite, I think, is, um, is named after a, a mineral collector, so an enthusiast, someone who's really keen. So, yeah, I guess, but uh, and it's not somewhere I've been. All right, I want to go there now, I'm fascinated. Uh, we've got one more Christmassy one, what do we got? Yep, uh, so the last one we've got is, well, the Christmas mineral is, is this one here. Let's carefully bring them over. Uh, so this is pentagonite, and I don't know if you can zoom in on this crystal here. Can you see it there in the middle? Yeah. And it hopefully looks a little bit like a Christmas tree. It's, that's its connection. <laughs> I, I think, I always think it looks great. I think it's a, a, a brilliant looking mineral. The color is amazing. And it's quite interesting to me and to, to mineralogists because it's, uh, it's what we call a dimorph of a, another mineral, which is the one I put next to it, which is called cavernsite. And a dimorph means that something's got exactly the same chemistry but the way in which the elements are bonded inside is different. It leads to a different symmetry and a different crystal shape. And the way these two have grown is, um, you know, they, so they produce different shaped crystals. Cavernsite is more platy, whereas the pentagonite produces these kind of fun little uh, Christmas tree shapes. And I guess as a bonus Christmas thing for pentagonite, but unfortunately I can't show you, is that pentagonite was named Pentagon, so five, it was actually named because the very first samples that were found were five uh, little, little stars with five points, just the way that the crystals grew. And then later, it's, we found it somewhere better that had the Christmas tree shape. So that's kind of fun. Do you know what makes them go in the different direction? What makes them dimorph like this? Is it, is it temperature or pressure or...? So I don't know specifically. I haven't looked into that. Um, many different minerals, you're, you're exactly right. It will be some subtle variation within the... Uh, formation conditions that will mean that the the bonds are slightly different and that's what yeah creates that dimorph many dimorphs and even morphology so that the shape of crystals will be telling us something about those original formation conditions or what we might call the nucleation conditions so what what caused the crystals to grow in the first place uh, and many of those things are unstudied you know we you know there's so you know, six thousand different minerals so to understand all the different things, exactly how they form is, would be a huge project. And um, yeah, no one's done that. So when you're categorizing a mineral and saying, this is officially a new mineral, obviously it's not just the chemical composition, it's also the structure. It is, yeah, absolutely. It's the, you, you need to show that mineral is unique. Chemical composition is a part of it, but perhaps most importantly is understanding where all the different elements go and how they bond together within uh, something that we call the unit cell. And the unit cell is your building block, basically, that repeats over and over again in three dimensions to create that crystal. And those unit cells can have certain symmetries, and those symmetries are what um, um, produce the crystal at the end of the thing. I assume you're using things like crystallography, are you, to do that? or like Crystallography is a massive part of um, uh, discovering new materials, yeah, um, absolutely. Um, crystallography and chemistry um, and we have a lot of the equipment to do that here at the museum so that's why sort of classification of new minerals new materials is a really big thing that we do the samples you saw of pentagonite and cavernsite earlier they're from a more recent find the original finds were were totally different and they didn't have that christmasy feel so this is an example of one of the the cavernsite earlier discoveries and you can't really see the crystal shape at all and then pentagonite was really small and that's our only sample in the collection of the earlier finds of pentagonite. So I couldn't really use it as a Christmas tree or a Christmas mineral until the more recent find came in, in India, where these ones from, uh, from Oregon. So those two there, left and right, they're the mm. same as those two yep. there? Yeah. Yep, we could yeah. line them up yep. just like that, really. That would, okay. be, that would work. So these were the early ones from the US, yep. and these ones were found in India, and they're a bit prettier. And they, they are, they're a bit more impressive, yeah.
Cavern site. Cavern site. Does um, that mean it was because it was found in a cavern? Uh, no, uh, nor is it found at caravan site. Um, it's named after its chemistry. So calcium vanadium silicate. So CA, CA, van, vanadium, site, SI, SI, so silicon. Is that common, Mike? Or are they normally named after people or places or from your experience? All of the above. So, yeah, generally speaking, you've just named the three main reasons minerals get called after a name, after a person, after a place, or probably more often than not after the chemistry of the material. Things that we can put into fuels, um, alternative solvents and those sorts of things. So this is the work of Morton, um, who's a PhD student here, unfortunately had to catch a flight back to Sweden. 